Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Awesome. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, we are ready to get started. Uh, but before we do so, the organizational committee would like to apologize for rushing a little bit at the end of the first session. We wanted to be respectful of your time. And in doing so, we created some palpable tension. Members of the organizational committee are friends, and we are uh, very close colleagues. And we have apologized to one another, and now we apologize to you for our racelessness under time pressure. Perhaps a lesson for all of us here is that the challenges of diplomacy are formidable, and that even us who are well-intentioned colleagues with shared passions and shared commitments, we can so easily encroach on one another's boundaries and borders. We are grateful that you're here with us, uh, grateful for your engagement, and we are welcoming your feedback at any time. As they say in the Middle East, Ya Allah, meaning onward. And I know that Farid loves my accent when I say Ya Allah. Uh, yes. thanks. <laughs> thanks again, everyone, for being here. And I will pass this to Farid, who will introduce today's uh, presenter. Thank you so much, dear Becky. Masalwar, Good evening, everybody. I would love to welcome you to our second session. First of all, I would love to thank our, uh, to thank our facilitators, Francis Gold and Raoult Pazner for doing all of the logistical work behind the hard work behind the scenes. And second, I would love to welcome our today's esteemed guests, uh, Mark Nave, Educator for Sustainability and Community, Director of Education at the Center of Creative Ecology on Kibbutz Lutan, and lecturers on Lutan's Green Apprenticeship Permaculture Design course. And I would love to thank our and introduce our second guest, Mike Kaplan. Mike is a member of Kibbutz Lutan and the founder and director of Lutan's Center of Creative Ecology. One of Israel's first permaculturalists, he has led numerous pioneering ecological projects, such as construction from natural materials, as well as advancing the regulation for natural construction in Israel. Mike initiated the building of Lutan's educational eco park and also created co and coordinates the permaculture design training course Green Apprenticeship, which has provided an in depth practical, ecological, and communal experience for students from all over the world. So, Ahlan wa Sahlan, Bruhima Baim, welcome. And Mike, I will give you the honor to lead today's session. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you, Farid. Thank you, Becky. Uh, we're very, very pleased and honored to be here. Uh, it's very exciting for us to be speaking to such a large group of people um, and sharing uh, of our experience. What we would like to do in this session is to tell you a little bit about the community process that we've been going through on Kibbutz Lotan for the last 25 years or so. Uh, I'm a member of Kibbutz Lotan. I've been here since uh, 1989. I arrived on Lotan from Australia, uh, came to Israel as a fairly young person, um, and I've been here since then. And in that time, we've been going through a process which uh, we think has been interesting uh, in how we can make a more sustainable community, how we can take more responsibility for our actions here. So I'm just going to share now my screen so that we can start with the, uh, with the presentation. <clears throat> okay, so I hope everybody sees that okay. So we're calling this session to till and to tend, building sustainable regenerative community. And um, I hope that, uh, well, well, we'll talk a little bit about what that means to till and to tend uh, as, we, as we go along. So I'd like to start off with a term which is a Welsh Gaelic term. So it's not from my culture at all but it's something that I discovered a little while ago and it kind of resonated with me. The term is hirath. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It means a homesickness for a home to which you cannot return, a home which maybe never was, nostalgia, yearning, grief for lost places of your past. Now, I find that really interesting, first of all, that there is a term for this um, because it, it seems to indicate that there's something very, there's a commonality here that people have. And for me, I, I relate to this, this loss, uh, this loss of place, loss of home, to, to connected to a loss of community. 
And I think that this loss of community is something that, uh, that is very um, prevalent in, in our world today, in our society today, particularly in Western societies in the global north. It's a process that we've really been going through for the last 200 years or so, uh, since really since the, the modernization, since uh, the Industrial Revolution. We've seen a gradual breakdown of what we can call organic community. And, and this is significant because up until that point, for the whole evolutionary history of, of human beings, we were basically living in small groups, first of all, tribes and then uh, villages. And that was really how, how people lived. So what does that mean, this, this breakdown of community? How, how significant is it? Uh, Dieter Doom, who's a member of the eco-village Temera in Portugal, uh, this is a, a quote from the article that I shared with you. Um, so I, if you've had a chance to read it, I, I, if you haven't had a chance yet, I really recommend reading this article. But he says that, that the destruction of through the destruction of community, humans have lost their authentic morality and sense of responsibility. And the community was and is the natural breeding ground for trust and solidarity. So once people are, are apart from, from uh, this natural uh, community, we lose something very important. Um, we become more alienated from each other. We become more isolated. We lose our connection with each other. And it seems to me that although many of us are living in mega cities surrounded by millions of people, there seems to be more alienation and isolation and loneliness than ever before. So how do we deal with this? And particularly, I think in, in these times of the, of the pandemic, it's very, very significant because we're really more isolated than ever. So this question of community, I think is really critical. And I would also say that um, the challenges that we're facing, not only the social challenges, but also the environmental challenges have at their root cause, uh, the disconnection that, we, that we've experienced from nature as part of this breakdown of community. So I think that perhaps it's, it's, it's possible to say that ultimately uh, the, the, the issues that we've faced with in, in also environmentally as well as socially have at their root cause this breakdown of community. So I think really the, uh, our, one of our biggest challenges today is how can we recreate this sense of community? How can we uh, bring community back into our lives? And how can we do it in a way that's relevant to today? Because it's not possible, feasible or desirable, I think, for most of us to go back to what there was. How do we create something which is, uh, which is, which is relevant and applicable to, to how we are living today? This is the challenge. And I don't say that we have all the answers, far from it, but, but we have learned a few things. I'd like to also uh, present this quote from Wendell Berry, American uh, author, philosopher, and he says that community is a locally understood interdependence of local people, local culture, local economy, and local nature. So connecting the dots here, how do we connect these things together? Um, how do we reestablish our sense of place? How do we reestablish our, our, our connection with each other? Um, what are the ways that we can do that? And I think that uh, what Wendell Berry is talking about here really uh, touches on what we understand from sustainability. Sustainability, of course, is a, a paradigm that's been with us for, um, for over 30 years now. And it's developed somewhat. At first, it was, it was a way of joining, uh, making the connections between the environmental sphere and the social sphere and the economic sphere. And I think that this, kind of picture this Venn diagram of overlapping circles is a little bit problematic and we understand that today that uh, we need to understand that the, the, the economic sphere is there to serve the social sphere and the social sphere is embedded in the environment so something more like this is perhaps a little bit more applicable today um, but since then I think that uh, there's been thinking that these three spheres aren't really enough that there's a fourth element here which is missing and this fourth element is, we could call the, the worldview or cultural or heritage dimension, which really connects up to these others and informs the others, because there's a growing understanding that culture really plays a key role as both a driver and an enabler for sustainable development. Cultural factors influence our lifestyles, our individual behavior, our consumption patterns, our values related to environmental stewardship, and also our interaction with the natural environment. 
And there's a growing recognition of the value of both of, of local, traditional and indigenous knowledge, uh, which can really inform our understanding of sustainability and, and how we can uh, utilize this knowledge to, to help us deal with the challenges that we have today. A quarter of terrestrial land is actually uh, on the planet is owned and managed by indigenous people. And uh, these areas actually have some of the best conserved ecosystems. 35% of global protected areas overlap with land held by indigenous people. Um, so when we take indigenous people away from, from the land that they're on, that's when we have uh, uh, environmental breakdown, environmental degradation. I think we've seen this uh, in our areas here in the Middle East. Um, the, the grazing systems that have been co-evolved with the, with, the, with the flora and fauna of the land here, they lose their biodiversity once the grazing is taken away. And we've seen this uh, with uh, uh, Bedouin communities that used to uh, graze uh, the desert areas here with their goat herds. Once the goat herds are taken away, uh, we lose biodiversity. So there's a really important lesson to learn here about how we can uh, utilize this knowledge and particularly the, this cultural aspect. How, how do we how do we utilize this cultural diversity in a way which can really uh, help us with sustainability? This is something that um, we've been involved with, with our, through our connection with the Global Eco Village Network. The Global Eco Village Network is a, is a movement which was established in 1995 as a kind of umbrella organization for linking up communities that are trying to deal with this issue of how do we create sustainable community? And they're doing it all around the world. There's something like 10,000 uh, communities um, in, in over 100 different countries around the world today that are under this umbrella organization. Some of them are traditional communities, such as uh, in, uh, in Africa and in Southeast Asia and in, in some parts of South America. And some are what we call intentional communities, particularly in the global north. In, in the United States, for example, in, in Europe, in Australia. And we'll talk a little bit about the difference between these two. So Kibbutz Lotan has actually been a part of this network since the year 2002. We connected up to it. And for us, it, it, the, the aims and the, the vision of this uh, movement very much resonated with us, particularly with this approach to cultural heritage and how this connects up to, uh, to sustainability. I think here we can really su uh, suggest a, a, a replicable framework for sustainable community because when we connect each other, when we connect up to each other through community and we connect to nature and environment and we also make our connections to our own cultural heritage, whatever it may be, then I think that this can really um, put us on the path to creating sustainable community. And this is in fact what we've been trying to do on Kibbutz Lotan. Uh, Lotan uh, is a community that was established in 1983 and this little statement here from our logo which says where earth and spirit meet I think is, 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 is significant because we're really trying to bring these two aspects together into, into this one holistic community. What is an intentional community? I mentioned this term before. Uh, an intentional community is a type of community where people are living together according to a certain uh, set of, of shared beliefs or values. The term was coined in the 1960s, uh, but uh, intentional communities have actually been around a lot longer than that. We just didn't really have the term for them. And in fact, the, the kibbutz movement, we could say, is perhaps the longest oldest still existing intentional community movement. And uh, obviously Kibbutz Lotan is part of the Kibbutz movement. It's something very, very specific to Israel. Um, it didn't happen in other places in, in quite the same way. But the, the, the Kibbutz movement, the Kibbutzim were really a very radical experiment in, community, in communal living. It was, they were based on socialist ideals the idea was to create a, an, an egalitarian society. The original settlers on the kibbutzim actually hoped that the, the whole of Israel would be, they would see in macro what they were trying to create in micro in, uh, on, the, on the kibbutzim. So they, they were based on socialist ideals, people living very, very simply with very little private property. They were living a, a very cooperative economy, a shared economy, 
uh, with very little private property. And uh, also uh, one of the most radical aspects was with the communal child rearing, where children were living in children's homes from a very, very young age. The kibbutzim were very instrumental in the establishment of the state of Israel. And today there are still 270 kibbutzim in Israel, although they have changed very, very significantly uh, over the years. And today, 75% are, are really no longer fully economically cooperative. None of them have uh, communal child rearing anymore. Um, but uh, the kibbutz movement is actually going through a process of, of kind of redefining itself. And um, many of the kibbutzim have gone through a process similar to kibbutz Lotan in actually changing their uh, economic model. So let's go over to kibbutz Lotan and uh, talk about Lotan as kind of a case study for community. And I'll tell you a little bit about the process that we went through here. I think it's important to understand the area that we're living in. Uh, Becky kind of touched on this uh, last time uh, in terms of our, our desert environment. We're living in a very peripheral area, the regional council of, of Hevel Lot. It's actually the, the second largest regional council in Israel, which is 13% of Israel's land area, but with less than 5,000 residents. So a, a fairly large area of land, but very, very sparsely populated. We're uh, dispersed amongst 12 communities, 10 of them are kibbutzim. So it's an area with a very high proportion of, of kibbutzim. Um, and another two communities which are not kibbutzim, they're, they're residential communities. Here uh, we can see an aerial shot from our immediate region. Here's Kibbutz Lotan at the top. Uh, Kibbutz Torah, where our, our neighbors, where the Aravai Institute is, is just down the road from us, a few kilometers down the road. Uh, you can see this yellow line is, uh, is our main highway. And the, the line here is the border with Jordan. You can see that it moves around a little bit. Um, the border actually fluctuated a bit. It, it was moved with the peace, peace treaty with Jordan in 1994. Um, but we're living obviously in a very, very harsh desert environment. Uh, again, Becky spoke last time about how we define what a desert is. Um, from my understanding, the, a, a true desert has 110 millimeters of rainfall or less. I, we, we talk in millimeters here. You'll have to translate that into inches, probably about four or five inches, less than four or five inches, inches of rain. Uh, a harsh desert has 70 millimeters of less. Here in our particular region, we have something somewhere around between 25 and 30 millimeters of rainfall a year. It's very, very variable, both in space and in time. You can be in an, an, an area here in the Southern Arava, which is, which is experiencing a downpour and, and a few kilometers away, the area will be completely dry. Um, we can have rain events anywhere between September and May. And we can get all of our rain in one event, or it can be spread over an, a, a number. But um, occasionally we do get some, some, nice, uh, uh, some nice amounts of rain. It's all relative, of course. These amounts of uh, this maximum amount of 62 millimeters, that's about the most that we could ever hope for on one particular year. Occasionally we get things like this happening where, the, where, there, are, where there are floods. And this is always a very spectacular seeing the floods in the desert. I'll just share you with this with you to show you. This is one of the rivers close by Lotan. Um, all of this water flowing down towards us, actually. That was, a, that was a flood just a few months ago that we had here. Um, always very exciting when that happens. Um, and we have um, quite, a, quite a diversity, actually, of, of wildlife. Uh, despite being a desert, there's a, there's a reasonable amount of diversity here uh, because we are on a border between uh, different kind of ecosystems between an African kind of ecosystem and, and, and the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, so we have uh, African species like the gazelle here and uh, acacia trees uh, and uh, the ibex here. And these are probably our most beautiful residents, the, uh, the little green bee eaters. We also have mi migratory birds here. It's a very important flyway for migratory birds, but these birds are residents. And even uh, hyenas, which live in the area here, I can't say that I've ever seen one, but uh, we see their tracks around often. So that's the, the, those are our, our neighbors. Those are the, 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 the true residents, we could say, of the area here. 
Lotan was established in 1983 and it was established uh, by young people. Um, some were Israelis and some came from uh, other countries, the United States, from, uh, from the UK. I came here from Australia. Um, most of the, the, the people that came here were graduates of the reform uh, Judaism movement. So the basis of the community was actually to, uh, in terms of if we're talking about cultural heritage, was actually how do we create a community which is based around uh, a Judaism which would be open and egalitarian uh, and creative and really cr make that as, the, as the, the community glue, put that front and center uh, uh, with the community and combine that with a kibbutz, which is an agricultural community. So these young people came here without a lot of knowledge about uh, how, to, how to make a community and they had to learn as they went along. Uh, the, in the early years, it was all about making the place livable. Um, everything that's, that's on Lotan today had to be put there. Uh, trees, grass, the, the buildings were basically concrete blocks that were placed uh, on the ground with really no thought about uh, uh, whether they were suitable for the particular climate that we have here. Um, the, the focal point of the community was the communal dining room where people would meet and eat together. And as a, as a young community, uh, everybody was basically uh, young singles uh, or young couples. There were no children in those early days. But that was, of course, the, the first probably biggest change that happened on the community was the birth of the children. Uh, as we moved from a community of, of young singles and couples to a, a, a community of families and thinking about how we, how we educate our children was really an, an important part of those early years. The base, the economic basis of the kibbutz was always agriculture and conventional agriculture, growing uh, field crops uh, in the sand, uh, in the desert, melons and onions, for example, and watermelons. Uh, dates is a very big uh, industry of, for the whole region here, and it's very much an economic backbone of our entire region. Uh, these uh, very large, juicy medjool dates, which are, are exported and are very tasty, a uh, very important part of the economy here. And the, the problem with agriculture, of course, particularly dates, is that you only get the harvest once a year. So in order to make a, a, a living, which, is, uh, which, which you can have throughout the year, uh, the, the going uh, wisdom was that you need a dairy. And so most of the kibbutzim in this area also have dairies where they're producing milk um, and the milk is going into production on, uh, at Kibbutz Yotbeta, which is down the road from us. So this has been the, the uh, economic basis of the kibbutz for a long time. Today, we're a community of about 150 people, um, around 60 adult members, uh, about 25 families altogether, around 60 children from the age of, of zero to 18, many that have already moved off the kibbutz and are living in different places around the country, um, altogether about 150 people. But as I said, we've, we've gone through different changes our economic basis is also changing. Uh, one of the most important developments economically in our entire region here is that we're moving over to solar energy. Uh, solar power, it's kind of an obvious thing that one of, one of the few resources that we have in abundance here is the sun. And so uh, solar fields have been going up in our region and we're, this is the one that's being built now on Kibbutz Lotan, in our fields on Kibbutz Lotan. Actually, we're, we're very proud to be able to say that 100% uh, that of our daytime electricity now is generated by solar power in this entire region, actually from the Dead Sea down to and including Eilat. So that's a very, very significant development that's, that's been happening in this region. So in terms of the community, as I mentioned, we, we really place uh, our, our cultural heritage, uh, our traditions, the, the traditions that we gained from, from, from our Judaism uh, in an open and egalitarian way, we, we place that as a very important part of the community. And I'd like to just show you a, a brief montage of some community events, uh, just to give you a little bit of a taste of, of how it looks uh, from, from some different events that have happened uh, over uh, the recent times here. <laughs>
Okay, so um, so there, I, I hope you get a bit of an idea about uh, how, how we celebrate here, of course. Unfortunately, a lot of that has stopped recently because of the COVID. We've had to put our, our restrictions on how we celebrate together, but I'm very hopeful that that will come back uh, in the not too distant future. Um, but um, I think that what's important to understand there is, is, is how we can try and elevate our day-to-day -day life through our cultural heritage, through ritual, uh, through our traditions and and make these events special uh, and to and to take the time to really uh, be mindful of, of of how we do these things together um, and I think what the, also what's unique about Lotan is uh, as I said we're trying to bring this kind of earth and spirit idea together this is the holiday of Shavuot which happens uh, at the beginning of uh, the summer uh, traditionally it's it's a harvest festival it celebrates the the wheat harvest so it's very much an agricultural celebration, but it's also a spiritual celebration. Uh, we, we celebrate the receiving of the Torah, of the, of the, the law, of our code of ethics. So um, that also becomes a very important part of how we celebrate. So bringing these two things together um, is, is really what we're trying to do here on Lotan. And I think that this was what really kind of led us uh, very easily into the path of environmental sustainability as well, trying to take responsibility for our, our environment here. And um, the process that we went through was something that, that developed uh, very uh, organically and slowly here. We started in the mid nineties, trying to think about how we could take responsibility for our actions. And that led to the establishment of, of various institutions on the kibbutz, the Center for Creative Ecology, uh, the, 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 the center that Mike and I teach in, uh, and the establishment of our eco park. This is the entrance of the eco park. And, and there's a, a passage which is written up on the entrance there from the book of Genesis. It says, the eternal God took the human and set the human in the garden of Eden to till it and to tend it. And um, this, I think, um, is really uh, significant in terms of the, the, the tension that it, that it gets to about how do we develop things, but how do we look after things? What are we, what are we intending to develop and what, we, and what do we need to preserve? Um, it's kind of uh, the, the idea between, behind sustainable development, I guess you could say, but, but for, for us in our tradition, um, this, is, this is an idea that's been with us really for for thousands of years. So this is in fact what we're trying to do on Latan to, to really take note of this idea of to till and to tend and to do it through the ecological work that we've been uh, um, going through. We started off uh, very, very small, just thinking about how we could take care of our trash. And this was back in the mid nineties when there was no recycling happening on, uh, in Israel at all. Um, and because we wanted to take responsibility for our trash and we didn't have anywhere where we could send things, we had to come up with our own uh, creative solutions. And so making a switch in our minds and saying, okay, let's try and relate to this, not as a problem, but as a solution, as a resource. And utilizing trash as a building material was something that we started to do. Uh, we brought in here truckloads of used tires until it really became a little bit too much for us to, to absorb them all. But we were, we were taking in used tires from other kibbutzim in the area and from the city of Eilat and filling those up with different types of trash and uh, basically building with them and also developing our community garden, our organic garden, growing uh, healthy uh, uh, vegetables. And this is something that Mike will talk about in more detail in a few minutes. So um, these projects gradually changed the face of the kibbutz. First of all, working within our, our eco park, uh, where we started to do some e ecological education, uh, doing these projects of building with uh, trash and with earth, and then uh, on the kibbutz itself. Uh, this is a project of a, a bus stop that we built uh, several years ago. The added benefit of all this was the community building aspect. I don't think it was really something that we planned for from the start. We were just thinking about how we can reduce our trash and do something useful with our, with our trash. But it really became evident that uh, these, were, these kind of projects were a really important vehicle for bringing people together and for really building community together. So it, they kind of turned into celebrations where we would uh, bring people together uh, after their regular work hours 
and uh, and start to do these projects. Um, often it was combined with food, so it was a really a very much a fun way of bringing people together and uh, and doing something which was which turned out to be beautiful and uh, and and enjoyable. So we got some quite good results. So these are. Uh, the types of pictures that you see as you walk around the uh, Lotan, you're seeing this this type of a, of work with this with these mud sculptures and uh, additions of uh, mud rooms on on existing buildings. And actually, I would guess that we could say that the kind of the crown jewels is our eco campus, uh, which um, we built as a place to house the students that come in our courses here, and it really functions as a kind of a model sustainable neighborhood. We really we built it as a, as a low impact, uh, sustainable neighborhood. These straw bales that you see in these top pictures, the, the, the domes are made out of these straw bales and we use that as an insulating material uh, because of the extreme heat that we have here. We have to insulate our buildings as much as possible um, in order to keep them cool during the summer. So although we have to use air conditioners, the idea is to see how we can reduce that energy uh, use as much as possible. And these buildings, in fact, uh, uh, enable us to save uh, at least 70% of the energy when we compare them to, uh, to regular buildings. So this has been a very, very significant work. Okay, so I'd like to pause at this point. Uh, I've been talking about Lotan and about the, the, the process that we've gone through as a community. And I'd like to pause and, and, and for us to think about community together. We're, we're, we're talking about community. Now we'd like to give you the opportunity to actually kind of talk about community together and, and to kind of form for a very, very brief time uh, some, some, some virtual communities through, uh, through breakout rooms. What we'd like you to do is just uh, for, for 10 minutes, um, talk about these questions or decide which of these questions you'd like to focus on. You'll be in rooms of about five people each. So that will really only give you about two minutes per person. You'll have to allocate the times amongst yourselves before we, we call you back to the main group. And we'd like you to think about what in what way does community play a role in your life? Whether the COVID pandemic has had an impact on that and how perhaps you've compensated for that or and or perhaps share uh, briefly uh, a personal experience of community. Uh, we'll put these questions up in the chat as well. So you'll have them there. And so if you open up the chat, you'll be able to see them. And we'll randomly allocate you now to some breakout rooms so you can get to know some other people on the course and to talk about these questions together. So Franny, let's go for it. Hi everyone, you should have received an invitation to join a breakout room, so.
Hi, everyone. Um, I don't know if you've received an invitation to join. Um, you're, everybody on this call should be assigned um, one already. Um, I'm going to go consult with the staff.
Okay. Um, Franny, maybe give me a sign when you think everybody's back in the main session. Is everybody back? Franny? I think not yet. Okay. Hey Mark, I think you can start. Okay, so thanks, Franny. Uh, so I hope that everybody's back now, and I hope that it was that was a, an interesting experience and enriching experience for you. What I'd like to do is is kind of do a sum up of of that. Um, whoops, are we seeing my screen? By the way, not right now. No, we're not. Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. I have to I have to share again. I think. Uh, yes. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay, so um, I'd like to kind of do a summation of that uh, because obviously it's too many people to really uh, uh, summate verbally, but let's do a, a little Mentimeter exercise. This is, a, there's a link in the chat uh, to go into this. Use three words to describe what community means to you. Let's uh, let's see what people come up with. Uh, you can write the words in, and they should appear hopefully on this screen. So just but kind of but maybe based on that experience that you just had in the breakout rooms or from uh, previous experience, how would you describe community? What does it mean to you? Write three words. And maybe somebody in the organizing team can let me know if the link's okay and it's working. Link is good. Link's good and it's working. Let's see what we come up with. So far, nothing's come up. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm not sure if people have, uh, have voted on it. I don't see any results on the screen. Um. Mark, maybe try um, hide results and then unclicking it on the left. It says press. It says press five to show image. Try that, Mark. No, no, that's the that's just the image that I had here. Ah, uh, I see. Right, but uh, no, it doesn't seem to be okay. We'll we'll move on. So, um, what I'd like to do Can now. Refresh it, dear Mark. Maybe to, to refresh. Yeah. Mm, I'm not quite sure how to refresh. Okay, I think we'll, we'll just move on. That's okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'd like to uh, just finish off my part by, by mentioning two other concepts that, uh, that are important to us here on LOTAN. Um, the first one is permaculture. Permaculture is, uh, is what we could call an integrated design system for designing sustainable systems for food and for energy and for habitat that we model on nature. Uh, we, so we, the idea is to learn from nature and to, um, and to use the, what we learn from nature to apply them to the systems that we create. 
We've been using permaculture for the last uh, 25 years here on Latan uh, through our ecological work. Uh, it was a, a, a system that was uh, that grew from from Australia. It started up in the 70s in, in Australia. Bill Mollison uh, in the picture here was uh, was the co-founder of permaculture, and he talks about a philosophy that's working with rather than against nature, of protracted and thoughtful observation rather than protracted and thoughtless action, of looking at systems in all their functions rather than asking only one yield of them, of allowing systems to demonstrate their own evolution. So. For us, permaculture is a very, very important set of tools for designing uh, sustainable systems. And it's based on three ethics, earth care, people care, and fair share. How we take care of, of, of our natural environment, how we take care of, of, of nature, how we take care of each other through community, and fair share, how we can ensure that everybody has equitable access to resources. And I think that this connects up very, very strongly with the, the framework that I presented before of sustainable community, connection to nature, connection to each other, and connection to our cultural heritage. I see the connections here with fair share. If it's a code of ethics that we, that we, that we get from our cultural heritage, then that for me is a very, very strong connection. So uh, permaculture has been a very, very important tool for us in, in doing this work. And Permaculture can work on many, many different levels. We can uh, work to create a sustainable home um, and grow vegetables and, and make our own energy at home. We can work on the community level and we can work on a broader scale, which is on the bioregion scale level. Um, so regenerative system design is, is the aim here. How do we design regenerative systems uh, for energy, for food, for habitat? Because I think that uh, in permaculture circles, particularly, we're, we're coming to the understanding that sustainability is really not enough. Uh, we've degraded our ecosystems to such an extent that merely to sustain what we have at the moment is not going to be enough. We need to regenerate. We need to uh, improve what there is at the moment and to reestablish ecosystems. So permaculture is a very important tool for this. And as I mentioned, we can do this on the framework of the community, as I've been speaking, but also on the, fr on the, on the level of the bioregion. What do we mean by bioregion? This is a fairly new idea. Um, a distinct area with coherent and interconnected animal uh, um, and plant communities. I'm sorry. Um, it's often defined as a whole life place with unique requirements for human inhabitation, so it will not be disrupted and injured. So. The, the concept of the bioregion is very, very important because it gives us a frame of reference which is broader than our own community because we understand that we, we can't create, we can't provide all the, all the solutions that we need just from our own uh, small community, but relating to also to other communities in the area, in the bioregion. So bioregional thinking or bioregionalism is about how we can connect people sustainably to the places where they live. And it's been called both a geographical terrain and a terrain of consciousness. In other words, it's, it's, it's not only uh, the, the, the specific natural features that we have in an area, but it's also the field of ideas of how we live in that place, the creative solutions that we can find for living sustainably. So three goals of bioregionalism, restoring and maintain local natural systems, practicing sustainable ways to satisfy our basic human needs, food, water, energy, housing, using local materials as much as possible, and to support the work of re-inhabitation, what we call re-inhabitation, um, meaning this idea of learning to live in place in an area that's been disrupted and injured through past exploitation. And exploitation may come through overusing resources, invasive species, destroying natural ecosystems, these all require our attention for regeneration. So uh, th this idea is something that we've been trying to do here on Lotan when we've been talking about uh, creating uh, um, a regenerative community and, and particularly uh, as a frame of reference for our own specific area, it's very, very clear that we're living in a bioregion that includes communities, not only on our side of the border, but also on the, on the, on the other side. Uh, there's a village which is called Rahme, which is over the border uh, uh, in Jordan, very close by us, but uh, separated by this political boundary. And yet they're sharing the same bioregion bio as us. So they have the same similar challenges to us. 
And we've been working, trying to, to find ways that we can cooperate and to help each other and to develop um, a common interests and, and, and uh, particularly through uh, e economy and ecotourism, for example. There'll be a session with Rena Kedem um, uh, later on in this course. She'll talk about transboundary work. But I, I, I really feel that this concept of bioregion, if we're talking about envisaging a, a new vision for the Middle East, how amazing would it be if we were to be able to relate to each other on a bioregional level? Um, and as, as some, as it's perhaps a fantasy for now, but, but bringing our political boundaries in line with our ecological boundaries through our bioregions, that for me would be a really a real uh, path to sustainability. So from this now, I'm going to hand over to my friend and colleague, Mike Kaplan, who's going to talk more about the tools that we use specific tools that we use, permaculture tools that we use in establishing a sustainable uh, community. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Kaplan. Uh, I'm originally from England. I've been on Kibbutz Lotan now for something like 34 years. Uh, and uh, I've helped uh, start the Eco Center together with Mark. And so I'm going to show you a few slides of the development of our community garden. Uh, as you can see here on the left, uh, this is what it was like at the very beginning. It really is just pure sand, a very, very extreme desert. And here on the right, you can see what it looks like today with uh, the trees growing around us, uh, all the different types of vegetables. Uh, we've even got here. Um, uh, a, a walkway where uh, now disabled people in wheelchairs can actually come in the middle of the garden and experience this uh, quite incredible feat in, in the middle of the desert. Uh, here's a few images uh, which I'll be going into into more detail. Over the years, our organic garden has been around for a long time, something like 30 years, uh, and we've learned all sorts of different techniques over those years. Uh, bio, biodynamic, um, biointensive market gardening, permaculture gardening. Uh, and I guess from every little thing, we've learned a little bit uh, and putting those things together. So I'm going to share with you an overview of uh, some of those things we've learned over the years. Um, how can I move this? There we go. So as we can see, living soil is the foundation for everything. This is a picture of our community composting area where we take all the food scraps from our communal kitchen and the neighborhoods around the kibbutz and really any organic matter that we can get hold of, we want to, to help it to decompose using nature's secrets and turn it back into soil again. Everything from nature in the end goes back to nature. Uh, we use big tools for this, these piles here. We use a tractor with a big scoop. We lift it up, turn it over, add moisture to it, and it turns back into this beautiful rich brown soil and then goes back into the garden again. We add that to the sand. Uh, and that's how we can do this uh, incredible things. So the foundation is what we call living soil. Uh, the fert fertility of the soil is key. Um, I think it's maybe, there we go. So we use the ready compost to put on the sand, but also use that ready compost to make tea. We love our cup of tea. We love to make also tea for the plants themselves so they can drink it and enjoy it like we love our morning tea as well. So uh, you can see this picture of a 55 gallon drum, plastic drum. Uh, and we add to that ready compost water uh, some sort of sugar source, so the beneficial bacteria can multiply and multiply. At the moment, we're doing experiments where we're not just adding different types of compost, we're also adding uh, worm poop, worm castings, uh, also biogas fertilizer into that liquid tea, and also something called indigenous microorganisms, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, we have also uh, 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 aquarium bubbler, which goes into this liquid, which adds oxygen that helps the 
the beneficial bacteria to multiply and multiply and multiply. In one day, 24 hours, 48 hours, we're gonna have this nice froth on top of the compost tea, and then we know it's ready to use, and that will go onto the roots of the plants, or it will be sprayed on the plants, and that'll be used specifically on a normally one week to two week regime, really helping those plants that, uh, or the heavy feeders, they lack a lot of food, or someone who's looking maybe a little bit sick, or our little tiny plants growing in the plant nursery, also to help them along a little bit. So we're trying to use uh, everything as local as possible and doing things ourselves without bringing in external inputs and paying money for things as well. So the indigenous microorganisms is something relatively new. We've been studying something called Korean natural farming uh, for the last year, year and a half. And here you can see in the picture on the left, this plastic green box, which is on top of the earth next to some moringa trees that we're growing. Uh, and underneath that green plastic box is this wooden box, which is on the right. Uh, and that's half dug into the ground with some uh, half cooked rice in there as a substrate for the beneficial bacteria to grow on the rice. And you can see that beautiful white fur is mycelium, local mycelium and other beneficial bacteria uh, starting to grow on the rice. That's what's called uh, IMO stage one, indigenous microorganism stage one. Uh, then we'll use that, we'll turn it into stage two, stage three, stage four, and that will be reintroduced after the, uh, the indigenous microorganisms have gone through some sort of uh, evolution. Uh, for our area. And we take uh, those collection boxes of, of a few different places in our garden. Uh, and that will go back into to the, to the area. And that's gonna help us um, just to make things more uh, successful. Um, like I said, to try and make the, the sand turn into a living soil, really. We grow or everything from seeds. Some of the seeds are bought. Some of the seeds we save from plants from the year before. Uh, you can see maybe from this picture, we're using uh, old yogurt containers to grow things, uh, really trying to utilize everything on the kibbutz as much as possible. Some of those plants we're gonna sell, some of the trees we're gonna sell locally. Uh, once again, trying to keep everything uh, within the system. Uh, we do make our own potting soil uh, using uh, ecological materials. Uh, we do have something we're a little bit worried about, and that's because we use coconut fiber, which is fantastic material, but it is from abroad. We don't have a local alternative. It's a lot better than using something like, say, perlite or vermiculite, uh, which are types of minerals which have been mined and processed. Uh, but we're, we're, we're doing experiment at the moment. We're taking uh, a, an agricultural byproduct uh, which is date palm branches, uh, and we're, we're helping to compost them with the help of uh, uh, cow manure and also the indigenous microorganisms, hoping that, hoping that can be an alternative for the coconut fiber, so that we won't be having to uh, import it in. And so we'll, we'll keep you updated about how that experiment goes. We've also got just so much date palm branch uh, agricultural waste because we grow so many date trees in our area. They need to be pruned once a year. So there's an enormous amount of date palm branches that we need to do something with them. So now we can see a picture of uh, our organic garden. It looks sort of quite uh, normal, hard to tell we're in the middle of the desert. We've got our rows and everything. Let's have a look and see what elements you can see here. So all of our garden beds are what's called a no-till garden bed. In other words, we don't plow the soil, we don't turn it over, we want to keep those beneficial uh, bacteria, microorganisms under the ground happy and not disturb their home. We don't want to dig into the soil at all, so we have walkways and we have rows and they're permanent. Uh, the drip irrigation is the only way that we can grow things uh, with the amount of rain we have here. Uh, as you may know, it's an Israeli invention. It's something like 80% efficient. It just drips, drips, drips slowly next to the roots of the plants. And then the plants have time to soak up that moisture and utilize it. Uh, it really is an incredible, incredible invention. So we have internal drippers. They, 
uh, every 30 centimeters, one foot. And we have a computers which, uh, uh, which normally gives it about four pulses a day. So it keeps it evenly moist. Uh, you can see these sort of, they look like uh, white, uh, I don't know, tablecloths on the ground. They're what's called a floating row cover. It's sort of, it's a little bit like uh, a fleece, which is used in gardening for keep the, uh, the vegetables warm in the winter, but these are a lot thinner. Uh, and they're put on top of the new seeds as we're growing them uh, on the, in the ground. And they're gonna protect them. As the seedlings start to grow, uh, that white floating row cover is gonna stop, it's gonna keep the moisture in. It's going to keep the birds and the insects away from eating those little tiny green uh, leaves as they come up. Uh, some crops will even stay underneath the floating row cover and they will literally float. They'll get higher and higher as things grow. Uh, it's such a simple, simple invention, uh, but really important for us just to keep that moisture in there uh, as things are, because the seeds have to stay moist all the time until they germinate, until the roots can develop to find that that drip irrigation. Um, on the, the picture on the right, you can see uh, there's onions and garlic, which is part of the allium family. Uh, and that is part of what we call crop rotation. Uh, in other words, different families of vegetables will grow in a certain area for the whole year. Then the next year, they're gonna go somewhere else in the garden. And it will take something like, or five years until that uh, vegetable family will come back to the same place again. And that's very, very beneficial to make sure uh, there's not a buildup of uh, pests in the soil or that the same vegetable doesn't take out the same minerals year after year after year. Instead, it moves because uh, some uh, vegetable families will, will give things back. Some will take more things out. Uh, and that's, that's a great way of trying to uh, keep the equilibrium uh, of the soil and the life in the soil uh, in good condition. Uh, here on the left, you can also see some, some metal frames. Uh, everything is uh, second hand, third hand or fourth hand. Uh, and these metal frames uh, we got I don't know, from uh, begging or borrowing. So we utilize that for shade in the summer for season extension, uh, giving us another month uh, that we can grow things um, under the harsh, harsh sun in the summer. So there are a few of the things we're doing. Uh, we also, we don't just grow vegetables in the traditional rows. We also have other types of garden beds as well, because we don't put all of our eggs into one basket, which is a good permaculture principle. Uh, also uh, as an educational tool as well. So for instance, here down the bottom, you can see all sorts of funky uh, containers uh, really showing people who come to visit us, even if you live in the city uh, and you have a, a roof or a balcony or concrete, you don't have any soil, you can still grow some of your vegetables and herbs in this manner. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, a suitcase where we're growing uh, trees out of the, the suitcase. We've got these uh, raised beds made out of old pallet wood, which would normally just be thrown away or burnt. Uh, which is great uh, use of them. Or we've got pallets here just used as they are, turned up on end, and they're turned into ver vertical fence with medicinal herbs and, and teas growing out of them. Uh, and, and these are great for showing to our visitors who come to visit uh, and, and showing all sorts of different possibilities, uh, hoping that uh, people will latch onto one of the ideas and take it home with them. Uh, super, super important. So we're always looking uh, at the bigger picture, trying to work with nature as best as we can uh, and bring some sort of uh, balance to, to the garden. So here are a few examples. On the left, you can see our beautiful uh, bug hotel or insect hotel, where we try and create conditions for beneficial bugs to, uh, to invite them into one of the rooms and stay there for the winter. Uh, you can actually see some of the holes have been blocked up. You can sometimes hear them inside making a, a buzzing noise. And then in the spring, they're going to come out and they're going to be right next to uh, the tender leaves where probably we've got uh, uh, other insects which are eating uh, the leaves, but we've got our beneficial insects right next to them to hopefully neutralize them out in some way. 
Uh, we do utilize uh, companion planting. There's all sorts of different strategies. One of my favorites is what I call flower power. Uh, for example, integrating herbs and flowers in amongst the vegetables is great. Here's a great example, the nasturtium. It's a beautiful flower, it's edible. Also the leaves are edible, uh, lots of uh, vitamins inside them, but it also attracts uh, beneficial insects uh, for pollination and also in general. Uh, it's also actually a, a, a type of flower which actually traps um, uh, non-beneficial insects as well. They get attracted to that instead of something else which is planted next to them. Uh, so we try and observe nature and integrate it into the garden to help make it more of a complete system. Oh, here's an overall picture of the organic garden in action. We've gone through many, many phases over the years from a, from a community supported agriculture where we used to uh, sell boxes of vegetables to members uh, all, uh, all over our area. Now it's a community garden uh, and the joy of seeing families and young children working in the garden once a week. Uh, they pay a little bit of money to become a member. They can pick as much vegetables as they want to take home. And to see the kids pulling out vegetables and eating them straight away with dirt on them is, is incredible. Uh, every now and again, we'll do a big meal together. Uh, and it's really actually helped with also the amount of people coming to uh, join the kibbutz, to become kibbutz members, because it is it's such a, a special thing. Uh, and so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really working well. So that was a few uh, elements of, of how we grow things uh, in the desert. And now I'd like to share with you uh, three themes that I think are the biggest things that maybe you can take home with you and do yourselves. Uh, so let me just move this out of the way so I can see. Uh, okay, so Margaret Mead says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change uh, the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Uh, and I totally agree with her. Uh, so permaculture is something that really changed my life uh, completely. Uh, I took a 72-hour uh, permaculture design certificate many, many years ago. Uh, and I can definitely define my life before I learned about permaculture and after. Uh, so from a personal point of view, I really invite you to see if there's a local course maybe you can go to. Normally it's 72 hours, two weeks. Sometimes it's once one day a week. Um, it's an incredible, incredible thing. Uh, we teach you also on Lotan, actually as a month workshop. So that's one thing we can do as individuals. Uh, in bigger groups, what you can do is please, please try and check out, join your local community garden or help to create one. Um, it helps to build local food security. So we're growing uh, food right next to where we live. Uh, and also uh, apart from, it's called a community garden because also we're growing community and not just growing the garden. So just the act of people working together of all ages. Uh, and it just gives us an excuse uh, to work together, to talk together and to eat together, which on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we walk past each other. We sort of, you know, we don't say hello, maybe. Uh, it's, it's a great way. And we all have something in common because normally we love to eat. So uh, what could be better than that? The, the last thing I'd like to share with is something called a transition, a transition network. Uh, and it started in 2005. Uh, I kind of call it uh, permaculture for the masses uh, because it's, it's taking the ideas from permaculture and it's sort of turning it more into the mainstream. I'm just moving this out of the way. So in practice, they're reclaiming the economy, sparking entrepreneurship, reimagining work, uh, reskilling themselves and weaving webs of connection and support. It's now an approach, the transition network that spread now over 50 countries and thousands of groups in towns, villages, cities, universities, and schools. Um, <clears throat> uh, there may be one close to you, just you don't even know it maybe. 
uh, it's really worth checking out. I think it definitely connects to the Mahatma Gandhi uh, quote, in a gentle way, you can shake the world from the bottom up. And then you notice uh, local councils and government actually changing things according to what uh, people want. So, so, so check that out. So I'd like to finish off with some lessons that we've learned for a successful community process. It's very connected to also the principles of permaculture and the principles of the transition movement as well. Uh, so we say number one, foster a clear vision, uh, successful change demands of the initiatives, uh, initiators, total commitment to a clear goal. Uh, number two, start small and be patient, so, so important. Uh, make participation easy and fun. Uh, community energy levels need that constant reinforcement. A negative experience can be extremely damaging. As we know, avoid co coercion. We don't want to make people do things they don't want to do. Uh, communicate intentions clearly and openly. Uh, very, very important. Uh, identify the potential blockers and involve them in the process. Uh, involving them in the process through one-on-one -on -one communication is definitely the best way to alleviate their uh, fears. Uh, number seven, be sensitive to the community culture. Um, change is more likely to occur if it's built as a natural development within existing norms. Uh, uh, that was number seven. Number eight, forge diverse alliances. So aim to unite people from all sectors and around uh, common goals. Uh, number nine, plan each project down to the last detail as much as you can, uh, and then observe those details and change things as needed because a successful group project is dependent on the preparation that's gone on beforehand for sure. Uh, number 10, enlist external support recognition of the value of the work from an outside source is the best way to legitim legitimize it in the eyes of the participants. And it's a great boost for everyone's morale as well. So that's our lessons that we've learned over time. Um, thank you very much for, it's been a real honor for us to share these things uh, with you. Uh, you can keep in contact with us via kibbutzlotan.com. Uh, you can also, I think our emails are going to be in the chat as well. Um, we would like to, I think, open it now for the questions, yeah. for questions and stuff. I think over here. Great. Um, so if people still have questions, you're welcome to uh, send them to me and I will field them to Mark and Mike. Our first question is, in what ways have you engaged with other communities around the issue of sustainability? Okay, so... Um, some things that we've uh, we've done over the years have been um, working, for example, with uh, with Bedouin communities, um, such as uh, unrecognized villages in the Negev area, uh, working with them about uh, sustainability issues such as uh, such as building techniques using natural materials, about waste management, um, and uh, and we've done so we've done trainings with with community leaders. For example, we've run also sustainability workshops for Israeli, Jordanian, and Palestinian youth uh, several times uh, over the uh, the last few years. Um, so these are ways that we ways that we try and engage uh, different communities, um, also our local communities here, uh, working with other kibbutzim in the area uh, with various uh, workshops and, and things like that. So that's uh, that's always something that's that's very important to us is how we can engage with with different communities. Thank you. Um, this is a question from Maital. How much of Lotan's agricultural practices come from the Torah or other traditional Jewish sources? Mm, interesting question. So um, <laughs> I think um, we, we, we definitely uh, focus on, on things like um, the, there are the environmental ethics that we, that we uh, I think, put into practice through our, through our gardens, uh, preserving trees, for example, um, the, the regard for, for nature. Um, there are certain things which I think um, 
the our, our cultural traditions don't really uh, relate to such as uh, companion planting and things like that um so we've, we've we kind of adapt that um what else can we think of that's perhaps uh online the, the the whole idea of 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 not wasting anything of 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 not having any uh, of what we call bal um of, of of not having any wanton destruction is very important in terms of how we utilize our waste and regarding waste as a resource instead of as just waste so that i think also comes directly from our our, our cultural traditions anything else no? i think also just sharing knowledge with people uh, that come through uh, and passing on information, not holding on to information as power, but actually trying to release it as much as possible to carry on uh, helping to, you know, tikkun olam, to change the world, uh, I think it is a uh, super part of our, of our everyday life and just connecting to this, I don't know, the miracle of nature. Great. Um, this is a question from Angela. How significantly effective do you think the kibbutz lifestyle is to the general conservation and sustainable efforts to this region? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I think that there are uh, there are many communities, particularly in our region, that are doing uh, different types of projects uh, working towards sustainability. Um, uh, as well as, as Lotan, uh, we also have uh, the Arava Institute, obviously, on Kibbutz Keturah, uh, that, that are very, very strong partners for us. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a community called Notz Madar, which is close by us, that, um, that they work very, very strongly with ecological methods, building and uh, organic uh, agriculture. Kibbutz Samar does similar things, which are also close by us. So there are several communities that really, um, I think, have taken on a more environmental agenda. I would like to be able to say that it's something that's more widespread in the kibbutz uh, movement. I don't think it really is at the moment. It's definitely something which um, which I think should be adopted more by kibbutzim in other areas. We're not quite seeing that uptake, I think, at the moment, although there are others that are doing uh, different projects in other parts of the country as well. I, th I think the communal kibbutzim as an idea was very very ecological just in the way it was run and i definitely i saw within our own kibbutz and other kibbutz and as soon as you privatize so things change a lot um suddenly i know we used to have four cars for everyone all of the members as soon as we privatized everyone got their own car uh, definitely the way of working in central communities it has so many advantages and uh, i can see sort of uh, the the pros and cons of both um, I just want to say there are lots of questions. We won't get to all of them, but thank you for sending these in. They're, they're really great. One question is from Kevin. How does the Kibbutz Lotan community manage its water resources to sustain a permaculture society in an extreme desert climate? We'll also be speaking about water next week, yeah. but it's a good question for you. So water is definitely an issue. And um, I, I think and to be honest, I mean, it's, it's really an, a, a non-renewable resource in our region because the water that we, we're utilizing is actually artesian uh, groundwater. Um, from what we understand, there seems to be a lot of water there, um, although it is uh, relatively saline, uh, but it is a non, essentially a non-renewable resource. The water that comes, that, that falls uh, uh, as rainfall, the small amounts that we do get, doesn't actually recharge that aquifer. Um, on the in the long term, I, I think that probably that the solution ultimately will be um, desalinated seawater coming from the Red Sea. Um, that's a, that's a way off yet, but it's definitely something that the whole region is really uh, trying to look at and understand how we can deal with this challenge as we go forward. Um, another question is from Adina. How do you reconcile dairy and uh, cows with uh, sustainability and regenerative lifestyles and the good treatment of animals? I think we were waiting for that question. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it's it's definitely a tricky one. Look, I I, I think that um, there's 
the Lotan was established as a, as a community that doesn't have that didn't have any kind of any form of environmental agenda and it's something that we've grown into over the years and there's still a lot of compromises and contradictions and we're the first to to say that that uh, there's a lot that, that we're that we're still doing that perhaps if we were established from the start as an ecological community we wouldn't really be doing uh, the fact of the matter is that we're still completely reliant on the dairy as a source of income and um, I and I don't really see how as a community we could survive without that at present um, so so that's the that's the, uh, the 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 fact of the matter uh, as things stand at the moment it's maybe an uncomfortable truth but we're still we still uh, definitely need the dairy we're um, we're trying to do it as sustainably as possible uh, reducing the amount of water that's being used, uh, not using um, or, or using as, as little as possible uh, antibiotics, um, uh, utilizing all of the compost, all of the cow manure in our in our organic uh, uh, fields, so so the 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 outputs from it are, are also being utilized. Um, so these are things that we're trying to do to ameliorate that situation. It's definitely not perfect. Nothing to add around that. Great. Um, yeah, as I said, there are lots of questions. I think we'll leave it with the uh, Vijaya's question. Do you think community gardens inspire wider change in communities? So community gardens beyond, you know, Israel and elsewhere in the world. That's pretty good. Oh, uh, yes, for sure. For sure. Uh, such simple acts as uh, also for for all of us, myself included, yeah. Um, at any age, we can I don't know, start taking control of our our health, of our life, of our uh, local area, and so it's super relevant. I think anywhere in the world, uh, especially with COVID, I think it's become even more like we've so many more people are now interested in permaculture, interested in growing their own food locally at home under whatever conditions. Um, so it's uh, it's it's uh, I think it's helping us go in that direction for sure, uh, and there, there's so many amazing amazing projects out there that uh, are bringing in all sorts of people. It's it does it grows. You're growing food and you're growing community, like I said earlier, and yeah, we can see it everywhere all over the globe for sure. Okay, so I guess we'll wrap it up. I will get to read. Well, to Daraba, shukran jazeelan. Thank you so much, Mark and Mike, for this really uh, eye-opening and sustainable lecture. Um, I, I really enjoyed it, and I hope everybody did. And before I continue, I also would love to thank our true unsung heroes here, also Lori and Melissa. I would love to tell you this. I hope in the sign language this translates well to everybody. So this is for you, and this is for Melissa. Thank you so much. Uh, we want to now take it to the next level. As a teacher, I can't leave you without your homework. So our challenge now as a transboundary community is how to imbue and drive what we're actually learning from those lectures into our own private life. So first of all, we would love like to thank you for joining us, but also would love you the, for sharing us your ideas for like the upcoming seminars we want to have this interactive dialogue between us on how you like integrate what you're learning in those sessions into your own life. So please uh, connect with us. We're gonna create like the medium uh, through different kind of networking uh, mediums so that you can share with us what you have learned and how did you integrate it. And also I would love to say that if you have extra question for Mark and Mike, you could either go to the LOTAN website, center, uh, website and then you can contact them or we, we're gonna share their uh, email and you can direct them, uh, you can contact them directly. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark and Mike again. And we're, uh, we're now like, uh, this is our, we're, we're finishing our second session and we're looking forward for our third session, which is going to be about the challenge of water in this uh, transboundary region and community. I would also love to say that it's evening in the Middle East. So it's also like uh, 
that's one of the challenges that we're dealing with in transboundary projects. So I really appreciate it for you, Mike and Mike, Mark and Mike, for saying so late after a full day work. And hopefully you're gonna answer our feedback. Our feedback form is in the on the chat. We take your feedback very seriously. So please uh, fill it and we we will try to integrate your feedback and also we would love like to go back and answer some of your questions so it's very important to connect with us on that feedback if anybody still has extra question we're going to stay after half past one so you're welcome to stay with us and uh, if not so thank you everybody and i hope that you enjoyed today's lecture and I'm looking forward to see you on our third session about water challenges in the middle east thank you so much uh, good morning in the United States and uh, Laila Tov and Tisbahu Ala Khair from the Middle East. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Same as um, Zoe Mason. Yeah. So, if anyone has any further questions and you want to take some extra time, uh, you're welcome to do that now. We'll stay on for a few more minutes. For those who stay behind, if you have any questions, uh, just maybe put your hand up or some way to tell Francis we can actually uh, unmute you and hear your voice as well. We would love to hear you. Um, I have two questions. Yeah, I'll um, spotlight, I'll unmute Sean first. He has a question. Hi, thank you. Uh, for either one of you, not sure who can address this. Uh, it seems that on Kibbutz Lotan, you've been quite efficient in recycling as much as you can. So my question is, and I say this in air quotes, I'm not the city planner in the group, uh, I met Lauren in our breakout and she's, um, Laurel, she's the city planner in the group. But how does Kibbutz Lotan deal with the inevitable human waste and sewage? Mm. So we have some examples of composting toilets. Our eco center has composting toilets in it, uh, which have been working for ooh, 25, 30 years. We've done doing experiments with them for a long time. When we built the new eco campus, so it was clear to us that we would have uh, toilets with no running water in them, so also composting yeah. toilets. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're relatively simple. They work very, very well. We know to change things on a larger scale because I think we do really need to, um, the, fl the regular flush water toilet needs to be in the museum, I'm afraid. <laughs> something which is more we don't need to basically dirty our drinking water and then have to reclean it again it just doesn't make any sense uh, but for that to happen we do need a, a modern system which means that people don't have to deal with it they you know it's beautiful you press a button it disappears and it and it gets treated in the bottom of the building maybe or something uh, there are modern systems like that out there uh, and we'll, but we definitely need to to push things along a little bit more because we, we can't waste our drinking water the way it is. Um, what else can I add? It's possible. Yeah, we have tourists who come here for an hour's tour. They come to the composting toilets. Uh, they scream and shout. They don't understand what's going on. There's no water tank. There's this big hole, uh, but it's nice and beautiful, the toilets. Within an hour, we've changed their minds a little bit, and they leave uh, understanding how human waste actually can be a resource. So so uh, I'm hopeful. I'm uh, positive that we, uh, we can change the sewage system and the, the toilet system as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shimon. Go to Michael Siegler. So I lived in a desert community for a while, I lived in um, Utah, and we had a problem with what we call what was known as caliche. It was soil, desert soil that had this hard rock level, like subs. It really, I mean, you, you, you had to till it in order to, to plant anything. Is this a problem? Do you, or, you know, you talk about no till, or, or is it all the soil really imported that you, or, or composted? 
But when we went to plant something in Utah, you had to till the soil at least once to break this caliche. So how do you handle that? Or, how, or is that a problem in the low time? So if you do have such an extreme problem, uh, challenge like you talk about, so definitely you need to do what you need to do. So maybe one time as a pioneer technique, you will maybe plow the soil, you'll do special things where you'll somehow open it up. Uh, but once you get that compost on top and inside, uh, nature will start to come back. Uh, the, the soil, uh, like give those uh, beneficial bacteria um, uh, what they need to, uh, and nature wants to live. Uh, uh, I've seen so many cases where, you know, with, with small changes, uh, big things can happen. We need to sort of help succession to sort of move things along a little bit uh, and uh, incredible things can happen. Uh, but at some stage, we need to stop uh, and just uh, uh, help by adding those beneficial bacteria I don't know, once a year by adding the, the layer of compost on top and, yeah, and to stop uh, turning things over. Although, even though from an agricultural point of view, from the beginning of mankind, that's what we've been doing. We've been plowing, but we need to stop plowing. So there's uh, four hands raised. Uh, I guess we'll go to Svia first. Yeah. Where, where did she go? Okay, hi, thank you. Um, I just, I'm just curious if you guys have any uh, cooperation, ecological, economic, or anything with kibbutz Grofit. Um, <clears throat> we're good neighbors. Um, I, there's, I don't think there's any kind of formal. Uh, well, I'm going to visit from Grofit. <laughs> right. our, our current uh, economic uh, manager is from kibbutz Grofit. She lives on oh. kibbutz Grofit. Um, oh. There's been some talk about some joint projects, but nothing so far. Uh, yeah. Hmm. You know the place? I do. I was in Habonim and I was there for a little while. Um, so it's curious to me because I know there's, they're so close and there's not a whole lot of people and kibbutz in the area. And it didn't sound like there's much of a contact or connection. So I was just curious about that. Like, there's personal there? connections. We're good neighbors. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right, thanks. Um, next we'll go to Anna. Hi, um, I'm Hannah. I currently live in Alabama. Um, and I kind of had a question about the community gardens and like helping to build community through community gardens. Um, I recently was asked to um, revive some neighborhood gardens in my neighborhood. Um, and I work as a full-time farmer right now, so I was excited to kind of work with the community to build up the, and revive this space. It, it became abandoned about like 15 years ago, but it's, it's really well built up. Um, but I'm realizing quickly that there are a lot of racial and political tensions sur surrounding the gardens. Um, right now, I live in like a predominantly Black community. It's very low income. And it's quickly getting gentrified, like houses that were $40,000 are now $330,000 in a, in a span of like a year. And so I'm trying to figure out how to use these gardens as a way to like preserve the history and the culture of the neighbors and the residents who have been here, um, as well as balancing all these new political and racial tensions that are coming in. Um, and I was just wondering, I kind of took a picture of your, your 10 steps to kind of building community and making sure it's an intentional space, but I guess wondering if there are ways to navigate um, how to create a space um, that I can, can kind of soften or almost put aside all the other tensions to focus on just growing food, because that's really what I want to do. I would imagine within the transition network, you're going to find some really good information for doing things like that. Also, I would imagine trying to do some sort of survey of talking to the people and seeing, I don't know, what their most favorite vegetables, what their most favorite um, recipes are. And then, and then together with those people, uh, probably often also the older generation. Yeah, the older generation are often uh, forgotten and they have so much knowledge. Uh, and so giving them the respect uh, to, I don't know, to grow the, the types of vegetables that they want and for them to kind of, uh, even though you're a farmer, sort of give them the, the respect 
uh, to, together with them to, to work together. And that may, I don't know, it may sort of help break down those, those boundaries I imagine at the beginning. Maybe you should get in touch with Ron Finley. Mm, it's true. There's, a, there's a guy working in uh, Los South Los Angeles by the name of Ron Finley. He's one of our heroes. Look him up on TED, TED Talks. Uh, he's got some interesting experiences about community gardens in low income areas. Ron Finley. Yeah, the gorilla gardener. No, the gangster gardener. The gangster gardener. The gangster gardener. <laughs> So there are three more people with questions. I think what we should do is just let them ask their questions one by one, and then you respond. OK. So uh, Jack, Malcolm, and OK, I'll, I'll start. Um, I'm head of a small nonprofit called the Water Resources Action Project, and we build rainwater harvesting systems in um, in Israel and in Palestine. We have about 14 schools now. Um, and we want to run a, um, a couple of programs that would um, involve all of our students um, at one scale. And that could be like 50 students basically for a few days or just the teachers. It might be like 15 different teachers. So uh, would Lotan be able to um, host something like that? Um, is the first question. And related to that, we work with both water harvesting and now we're moving into hydroponics. Uh, are there those things being used at Lotan um, or be considered for use? Okay, thanks for the question. Hi, uh, I'm Brian, I'm coming from New Jersey. Uh, I'll actually be at Arava later this year uh, as a research intern. So I'm looking forward to getting to know you among uh, many others on the call. Um, but I have a quick question um, just pertaining to uh, the community process, that 10 step uh, list. Um, what are some of the characteristics and essential roles of a good team to make any project of these natures happen? Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I guess I'll ask my question as well. My name is Jack, thanks for having me. Um, my question is principally an economic one. Um, the, the question somebody asked about the cows, it just it made me interested to wonder if there are any other means that you guys are working on kind of, you know, making the necessary evil, which is money. Um, are there any other ways that you're working on that? Uh, do you have any visions for that, etc? That's all. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks for the questions. Um, so, so Malcolm, we would love to host a training such as you describe, whether it's for the participants or for the or for the teachers. That's what we do. And uh, so, be in touch with us, and and we we can uh, work that out. We we'll talk about hydroponics. We've done small scale um, experiments on the kibbutz, something called window farming, where we've taught we've uh, taught people how to do very simple hydroponics with Coca Cola bottles and tiny tiny air pumps, which use almost no electricity. Um, uh, apart from that, we haven't done anything bigger than that. Um, so, yeah, we, we've studied a little bit about it, but uh, yeah, it's on our list of things to 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 get into in the future for sure. So Brian thank asked you. about thank you. Brian asked about characteristics of a good team. That's an interesting question. I would say some of the things that we mentioned at the end, um, having a, a, a clear vision, I think, is a really really important start. A, 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 an initiating group which can uh, which have a vision together of, of what they want to get to, and having a good communication with uh, amongst themselves, and it's something that really needs to be. Um, needs to be fostered and developed, um, talking about process as well as about goals, about how we do these things, process and relationships, as well as, as the goals that we're aiming for. Um, anything else about that? I think it's really important just to take the time to have fun, to enjoy yourselves, because often, you know, it can get so depressing and, you know, and, and so, I don't know, you even... Uh, celebrate your mistakes as well because that's the only way we learn and so we make a lot we've made a lot of mistakes over the years and that's the only way we can we can improve in the end so i don't know uh, we say uh like sort of have a reason for you don't need a reason to have a party or to to share things and and yeah otherwise it, things get too heavy and then and then who wants to come and do things there 
So Jack's question about economics. So um, our current economic manager is very busy uh, searching for new ways of uh, that we can bring an income in. It's not easy in this region, of course, as you've seen. The solar mm -hmm. power is very important. There's a there's a big biogas uh, uh, project which is in the making here, which is also exciting. Um, <clears throat> other things. Well, uh, just our our, our guest uh, hosting. Uh, the tourism branch and, and our ecological projects, you know, we hope that that will continue to grow and develop and start to bring in an income, at least. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the main things where the, the, the community is looking at at the moment. Fantastic. So thanks for all those questions. It was great to... to Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for everyone from staying behind and asking questions. And again, Mark and Mike, thank you so, so much for this very interesting and, and uh, enlightening uh, seminar today. Uh, you were great. I appreciate everyone uh, being here and we will see you all next week where we'll talk about water. So that's also very interesting. Thanks for having us uh, on your Sunday and good night for those that are far away in Israel. Go to bed. <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Toda.